All right, and we're recording. This is, I suppose, this is the third episode, at least the third episode of recording of uh, what I am calling things that first year writers need to hear, and you'll never guess what it's about. Um, and I am here with a uh, professor of sociology at Hamilton College in Clinton, New York, uh, Dan Chambliss, who taught me for three classes, if I remember correctly, and I think I do. Um, and I wanted to get, Professor, I wanted to get you on today for, <clears throat> well, a number of reasons, and, and here, here they are more or less. So I have, well, there, I guess there are kind of two reasons. So the first one is that your sociological theory class, I think it was the 300 level, I think I took it in my junior fall, because mm -hmm. I was abroad in my junior spring. And I think that that was probably the, the most effective single class that I took for improving my writing at, at Hamilton. Yeah. Um, and you had us write a two page paper every single week, but because it was Hamilton, what you really meant was that you wanted us to write a five page paper in two pages. <laughs> and yeah, it was, I still have some, of, I actually, you know what? I think oh, I actually yeah. have one or two of them right yeah. here with your comments on them still. Yeah. That I kept around because, yeah. well, for one, I was kind of pleased with them, but for another thing, it, I, as I've started teaching writing, it's become helpful to have examples yeah. of things that went well, that went poorly, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. That's yeah. kind of one reason. Yeah. And the other reason that I wanted to get you on here was that. So I, I have a sort of list in my head of, say, six or seven professors and teachers that I've had over the years that I like to model my own pedagogy after and to some extent, and you're on mm -hmm. the list. Oh, and That's nice. Well, <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, Merry Christmas and all that. I'm glad you didn't finish that sentence by saying, and you're not on the list. <laughs> And then but I have would have been a, but it would have been terrible professors. Yeah, yeah, but it would have been a more powerful sentence in a way, right? They're very true. Jeez. But it wouldn't well, have been as true. <laughs> um, well, okay, that's okay. But the but all kidding and flattery aside, the, the reason that I bring that up is because the thing that I'm interested in hearing from you, mm. or the thing that I found particularly helpful to observe in my own development as a teacher. Hmm. was the way that you are constantly able to take some of the most wildly complex ideas that are out there yeah. and deliver them extremely simply, not yeah. simplistically, but, but simply. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of generally why I wanted to take an hour of your time and talk to you here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But, you know, so I, I have, hmm. you know, a few different things, but, you know, whatever. I think okay. I'll start with the general question, which yeah, is, sure. yeah, I got lots to say. Right. Just from what, what I, you've said well, so what far, is, this, is, long, this long, is good. No, but right go into, what is it that you have to say? Because that's basically the question. <clears throat> well, um, let's see. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate all that. You know, uh, everything you say makes sense. Like I, I think I agree with you about a lot of the things you said there. Uh, and, and the, the fact, for instance, that I use two page papers, that's not an accident. Uh, and, uh, anyway, so I guess I would say just as a disclaimer from the start, I don't think my way of teaching writing is, pro I don't think it's the best way actually, uh, in general, like if you were writing a kind of abstract argument about the best way to teach, I don't think I would do it. The best way is probably starting from what students want to say. And then building out from that and say, well, this is an effort for you to convey something you think to an audience and it's a particular audience and therefore you need to do it this, this, this and this. OK, I think probably in general, that's a better way to teach writing than what I do. I take a different approach, which is um, which actually comes from the way I used to coach swimming. And it's. Um, it's what I think of as, as craftsmanship. That is, let's think of writing as a, a set of techniques for doing something particular. Uh, analogy would be carpentry, right? And 
the neat thing about this approach, uh, and that, that means that what you teach students is very particular ways of doing certain things. And what's cool about it, though, is uh, it taps students' motivation. Uh, this is what I like. And for me, that's the heart of teaching. I mean, the whole goal of teaching is to motivate people to want to learn, right? The information is easy. It's out there. Everybody can, you know, you can open the internet or read books or whatever. The problem is getting students to want to do it. And so, for instance, a two-page paper sounds like, oh, yeah, you know, I can bang that out in a matter of, you know, Thursday evening, which is when my students usually do it. And and, and that's a way in, okay? So it's a, it's small enough, it's a small enough project that kids aren't terrified of it. That's key. Because the, the biggest problem is just starting it, is just writing something. Um, and that's true for everybody. That's true for everybody. Um, and so what you want is a, is a very doable task that they can do right out of the gate and that everybody goes, oh yeah, I, I can do that, okay. And then what I do is uh, is ask students to do relatively simple things, again, that they know they can do. And that there's, in effect, in their own head, there's no excuse for not doing it because it's so easy. Um, so example would be, I'll say, uh, early in the course, I'll say, okay, um, this week, all I care about is your topic sentences. So, you know, the key sentence in every, in each paragraph, and all I want you to do, the only thing I care about, just underline each of your topic sentences, right? Like go through your paper after you've written it and just underline, yeah, just underline the topic sentence. That's all. And people go like, well, you know, how hard can that be, right? It's not hard. I mean, it's a little hard because once you start getting into it, what, what I found is that asking students to do that just underline the topic sentences, uh, drags with it a lot of other good things. Is this making sense? Can I, and I actually want to cut in right there for Please. on specifically that point because yeah. the other, I guess the third secret reason, which I didn't mean to make secret, that I wanted to have you on here was because in that sociological theory class, specifically on the topic of, well, topic sentences, I had what I still look back on as a breakthrough in my thinking about how writing works and how I could explain it to other people. Mm -hmm. Because I had known for a while, like most people know, at least on a surface level, that writing is thinking or that you think as you write. Yeah, yeah. And... <clears throat> You know, you hear that, but you pay it lip service, and it doesn't really percolate downward to the level of operable belief. What does that mean? Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then when you pointed out to us that we should, and I I wish, I don't think they will have seen this, but I have here printed out a copy of the handout that you gave us yeah. in that class. And um, when you pointed out that we should be underlining our topic sentences, and when you also pointed out that a lot of times the topic sentence will pop up at the bottom of the paragraph because that's the first time where you really crystallize that thought. Yeah. For me, that was the first observable manifestation of the idea that writing is actually thinking. Yeah. And it, it grounded it. And from there, that was sort of a threshold moment for me because I yeah. started to see, oh, I can think about the practical ways in which you need to think as you write or yeah you know all these vague abstract principles that yeah. we hear about in writing that grounded one of them for me and yeah. it showed me that they can be grounded yeah and yeah. that has formed that's still something that i tell my students is like you'll find it at the bottom of your paragraph and you'll find your thesis and your conclusion in the first draft you write. yeah because that's by about the time you figure out what you really meant right uh, you no, know, it's a great concept. Writing is thinking. The the way I think of it is uh, is uh, my brain's not that big, you know, like I'm not particularly smart, uh, but I have a really big hard drive. External hard drive is I, I use the, the kind of the computer metaphor that there's not much RAM, you know, there's not much random access memory, but but I can externalize my brain 
by writing things down. And I do that all the time. You know, I've got piles and piles of notes on everything. And then it's a matter of looking at it and moving things around and saying, oh, this works better here. This works better there. And so, again, the brain is kind of outside of yourself at that point. And you're working it around, again, the way you'd move, you know, pieces of a puzzle around or bricks if you're building a little wall or something of that sort. Yeah. And it's very funny because the way and perhaps I guess perhaps not coincidentally, considering I studied under you to some extent, the way you're talking about it, even the reference to computer engineering is kind of how I talk about it. Yeah. You know, the way you know, my, my students will often ask me and I had yeah. sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no. I mean students all the time will say, well, um, uh, you know, I, I have I have to have the paper, you know, in my head sort of before I start writing. I'm like, oh, God, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, you got to have a brain like this. That's craziness. You can't do it. You can't do it. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, it seems to me that. Well. A lot of there are a lot of things that it seems to me at this particular crossroads in the conversation, but I'll yeah. stick to this that. Yeah. You know, it's it seen the way I my, my students will often ask me, well, how do I know when I've started my paper if my thesis is correct or if I got a right thesis? And I tell them it won't be. I know the one thing I promise you is that you no. will be wrong in some way. Yeah, sure. Because what do you know? Right. Because I mean, you're just starting something out. It's like the point of an essay is not to report on ideas that you already know. It's to actually go out and explore a field yeah. of ideas, learn something about it. And then, you know, at the end, you sort of crafted into something that you can present to some someone else but right i mean it goes back to the the word essay is actually from the french yeah yeah it means, it means trying, trying it, but right try. yeah and the, the computer science reference i've started making nowadays is have you i don't know if you've heard of bremerman's limit no so this is and my my knowledge of this is wikipedia level knowledge so yeah yeah like this is true like the first line of wikipedia <laughs> Um, it's Bremerman's limit is a computing is a computational science uh, formula that calculates the maximum rate of computation that can be done by a computational system in a given volume. So that if you had like a computer the size of the Earth and right. you had maximized the efficiency down to right. the level of the right. atom, right then it could do like this thing in like yeah. a split second, this thing in two minutes, this thing in like 75 yeah. years or something ridiculous. Yeah. And, you know, what I point out to my students when I find the time to bring up that is that that means yeah. that thinking takes time. Yeah. And that's a truism, but it doesn't get grounded for them a lot of the time because mm -hmm. they think that, like you said, they can just have the essay in their head and they're just supposed to know it. No. No, that that's not the case. It also it's also a nice image for uh, again this idea of externalizing your brain. Mm -hmm. So if you're writing something, again, you can use pieces of paper is what I always use, right? You can use your computer, although I find it harder to see everything at once on a computer. Uh, and you can use other people for that matter, right? You know that um, I'm not encouraging uh, plagiarism here or anything, but but that you uh, like if I you know I write some book or something which i've done right i shop it around to a bunch of other people and here are their comments and they make suggestions and i go oh that was stupid i shouldn't have done that you know because fane told me you know blah 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 you, you know and he fixed it so then you fix it you give the person credit and all of a sudden your book is much better right because in effect you've drawn on the the cloud right you've drawn on the brain power of a lot of other people well, as well as about. yourself yeah sure Sure, that's the whole point. That's why you go to a university, right? So you can be around other thinking people, not just be sitting by yourself in a closet somewhere. Yeah. So yes, I absolutely. So it's a process. So the thinking is a process. It's not just like sit in your head and go, mm, you know, like trying trying to do, you know, four column or, um, multiplication or something like that in your head. It's very very hard to do. Do it on paper. It's a breeze. Right. Same same concept, yeah. Kind of why I say that my essays tend to be smarter than me. So I just yeah. turned in my two, I turned in oh. a paper yesterday, turned in David before. I can't remember everything that is in this paper. You know, no. To, to quote Sean Connery from uh, La The Last Crusade, I wrote it down so I wouldn't have to remember. 
That's right. So. That's the idea. That's the brilliant, the genius of, of it. Sure. Sure. But, sorry, you sounded like you yeah. had something else to. No, 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 no. I, I don't know which way you want to go. Oh, I, like I said, these are kind of informal, so I'm not okay. too. Okay. Okay. Sure but I do. Okay. Except for, I say that and now I'm going to actually try to direct it a bit. That's all right. I do want to talk about the way in which when you teach, there is a way that you have of talking about things that is extraordinarily simple. Yeah. yeah. For, for the complexity of the idea. It's so yeah. striking that I can, mm-hmm. I have a vivid memory memory in my head that maybe partially <laughs> talk about, I don't know. But like vivid enough that I can remember where I'm sitting in the classroom. Oh, wow. Nice. And I can remember, and the funny thing is I can actually remember the tone of the, of the voice and your cadence. I think I can even remember some of the hand gestures. Uh, I can't actually remember the content, which perhaps yeah. speaks oddly to my attention. But <laughs> no, 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 no. But it was this idea that we'd been batting around the classroom, you know, among the students, and we just couldn't figure it out. And you, you know, calmly paused and said, "Okay, so if da 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 da, yeah, and da 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 da, yeah, then what about this?" And we yeah. all just kind of got there and went, "Oh," and. <laughs> How do you do that? That's the question. Great, How isn't do you it? Get to a point where you can. It is. Wow. It is cool. It is cool. I, I mean, I think it's cool. All right. I, you know, the 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 breakthrough for me on that was uh, when I was in graduate school. <clears throat> One day, I went to a seminar with this real quirky genius professor like he was a very odd guy and everybody thought oh he's he's goofy but he's brilliant he's brilliant you know and he talks about stuff nobody can understand it's so esoteric it was network theory and he was an economist by training and very mathematical stuff and he you know harvard junior fellow all this kind of business anyway he's supposed to be brilliant he was like 28 so i go to this seminar he's he's doing a, a talk Well, only four people showed up, you know, because everybody's like, oh, no, this guy's kind of psycho or something. Anyway, so I show up and he was going to talk about network theory. And I figure, well, I don't know. I haven't a clue, but, you know, I got nothing to do. And I get in there and he starts out just drawing like a little circle on the blackboard. And he says, well, this is a person. He says, and over here is another person. Right. And he draws a line between them and he says. That's a link between those people. Okay, we're going to call that a link. Yeah, right. I'm having the reaction you're having like, yeah, you know, pretty basic, right? And what he did is then he had another link. And then, and within about 10 minutes, he was into this incredibly complicated stuff. But I could follow it. Because he started with the very, the most simple element of it and said, here's basically what we're going to talk about. Now, let's see. If you have that, then you have this, then you have this. And I realized that, A, there's nothing wrong with starting out with the obvious stuff. That's good, right? And in fact, B, it's good, because then the students feel like, I got this, right? You know, this makes sense. And then you add it up, because in fact, everything is like that. In fact, you know, calculus is like that if you start at the beginning and the problem is a lot of teachers don't start at the beginning they they want to make it big and fancy and elaborate and esoteric you know to use a big word uh, right from the outset and so they lose everybody the example would be using a lot of jargon in a theory class using a lot of academic lingo that students don't know it's not helpful at all you got to start on the ground, so to speak, where the students are and say, look, here are two people and they get together and they start talking. Well, why, why do people enjoy conversations? That's something you and I have talked about in the past, right? That we talked about in the theory class. What is it that makes a conversation work? Well, the fact is every student in the room is going to know the answer. Not explicitly. That's the thing. They haven't laid it out. They haven't thought it through and theorized it, right? But everybody knows what makes for a good conversation. So if we talk it through, we ought to be able to figure that out and lay out the the components. And that's what it turns out sociological theory really is. 
but anyhow, so I, I think that's part of the what you're describing my let's say my ability to make things simple is is not so much about making them simple as making them concrete so i'm always asking students in class we take some sentence out of some real difficult theory text and say what does that mean what does that look like in real life can you give examples of that right and so then it becomes alive i think i think that's what's going on anyway I, that definitely describes my experience in your class, as I can remember it, mm. um, or in your classes. But it's, it also describes I, what at least I try to do with my students on even the first day yeah. of the first year writing course. Because like, I'm, I'm pursuing a career teaching first year writing, which is perhaps not surprising, given that we're doing this. Yeah. But so I generally try to tell students two things. And the first thing I tell them is that I don't ever want you to tell me something that you think I want to hear, because what I want to hear is what you actually think. Mm. And one of the reasons I tell them it in that way is because they all know yeah. the, the feeling of writing an essay for someone, trying to get it right, trying to tell them what they think the person wants to hear. So that, yeah. that hits them where they are in some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing I tell them is this. So, and, and this is back to your point about sort of, you might say, meeting students where they are, explaining yeah. it in terms that are grounded for them. Yeah. I'll tell students, so how many of you have, when you're in the course of writing an essay, come across an idea that you didn't expect at the beginning? Like everyone's here. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I say, okay, so how many of you, when you hit that new idea, felt like, Oh no, I've messed up. I got to start over or I got to sweep it under the rug. Mm. And like most of the hands go up. There are a few students who have kind of learned the lesson that I'm about to tell them at this point, but most of the hands stay up. And then I tell them, okay, well, what if I told you this? That when you come to that new idea, that is not a sign of failure. That is a sign that of success, that your writing process is doing exactly what it is supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I can, I have, I can remember one student who went genuinely bug out at hearing that. She was like, Oh yeah. Excuse me? Why didn't know she didn't say this, but the expression clearly said, Why yeah. has no one told me this before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it yeah. it made it yeah. immediate. It, it was an entry point for them. That's yeah. the thing. It yeah. was the way through which they could be and that class just did great. I just I wrote a recommendation for one of those students the other day where you know, to a research grant, I got to talk about how she wrote like twice the length of final research paper that she needed to, and like it needed to be that long. It was like she was great paper immediately. You know? <laughs> so, but it's 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 very surprising what that what starting from that point in building out slowly can do. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. Well, and that's the big thing too is you got to you know if you're teaching writing or anything. You know, you've got to um, express your own delight in the student's progress, I guess. <laughs> you know, like I think a big part of teaching is, in, is, if you really want to do it well, is, and it's not this common, actually, is, uh, is enjoying seeing other people succeed. And I think uh, one of the downsides of the professoriate is I think a lot. Truthfully, I think a lot of professors want really want to be the smartest person in the room. Like that's why they went into this line of work, you know, is to just kind of show off and be smart and stuff. And I think that's probably detrimental. <laughs> I mean, it definitely is. I I don't know. You you would obviously have more experience with it than I would. And I guess I've had more experience with those professors, or I focused my attention on those elements of my experience, which have been with the better professors like yourself. So maybe I'm more optimistic on that than I should be, but it's definitely the case that I've run into yeah. professors, you know, here, there and everywhere that yeah. are kind of teaching to, to put it as, to put it as meanly as possible, teaching to prove that they're smarter than their students. Yeah. Yeah. And you can go a long way with that. I mean, I've, I've certainly known people who were known as, very good teachers whose strength 
was being smart in front of other people, right? And they were great at it. And you could admire those people and you can learn from them and so on, but it has a limit because they've put a limit on it, which is you can do real well in my class. You can be real smart, but you can't be smarter than me. <laughs> hmm. See, and the fact is like me, if I look at the, uh, the students in my class at hand, every semester, I've got kids who are smarter than I am. I mean, I okay. know that now they are, they're younger. Okay. And I don't say they know as much as I do, but that's because I've got a, you know, 50 year advantage. I mean, it's, it's kind of not fair. So yeah, I know more sociology or I've read more stuff or I understand more concepts or whatever, but, but they have the native intelligence that's ahead of mine. And so in class, when that happens, I'm delighted. I'm not surprised. Well, you know, and, and then say, please, you know, say, could you repeat that again? So everybody else can benefit. Exactly. And so then students are taking notes off of other students' comments, which is where you really want to be. Well, you, I mean, the discussions in um, our classes, and more so in the higher level classes, which is perhaps not, yeah. but I, I don't, you may not remember, but I took, let me see, I took Classics of Modern Social Thought. Yeah, yeah. And I took that one when I was an upstart little freshman, which mm -hmm. I halfway regret and halfway don't because it was an important developmental experience but it also would have been better to take later. But you would have gotten a lot more out of it if you were a junior. Is that yeah. Right? Yeah, and it's, for that class. Yeah. So I took That's that fine. class. Yeah. I took the intro of, I think it was American Society or yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah, it was American Society. That was a 100 level. And then the sociological theory course. So theory, sure, sure, and sure. The higher level courses, not the American Society one, those tended yeah. to be better. Yeah, and they're different. Conversation. Well, they're different. I mean, American society, an intro class, the thing about intro is it's unfiltered. The students are unfiltered. That is, you've got everybody, you know, and so some of them aren't particularly interested in the subject. <laughs> right. So, you you know, you've got kind of a cap on how good the discussions can be because there are people in the in the room who are like, uh, um, I, I mean, that doesn't happen much at Hamilton, frankly, but um because they at least know how to fake it. They know how to fake it and they're engaged and they're good students anyway. But, but uh, you know, as you get the more upper level, you tend to get more people who are really into this thing. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's certainly a plus. Plus you've got enough background, that, you know, to get into some cool stuff. Intro for me is just all about trying to get people interested and trying to convince them this is a worthwhile thing to think about and study and it but it's it's it really is intro you're not well i don't know i suppose it depends well on you i remember in that class you talked some about some of the i guess the tools yeah and they're they're, they're sociological tools, but they're more just logical tools like you you explained the idea of a causal mechanism yeah and like a necessary but insufficient yeah stuff factor. like her i sure. think you explained dual causation at some point well it's college right you know? you know, yeah. And good thing about college is you can talk about more interesting things than high school. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's very yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking at my little notes here that I scribbled down <laughs> before we talked. Uh, I'll give you one thing. Okay. So yeah. you, one of your questions um, in your email actually was what do first year writers need to hear that they don't often hear? Yes. Yeah, so I, they hear this all the time, but let me explain it, which is it, it really is all about your audience. Um, and by audience, I, here's an example. Um, last time I wrote a book, I, I thought, OK, who's the audience for this book? And I thought about it a lot because it was a hard question. And I eventually came down to saying, well, really, it's these five people. Mm. I mean, there were five individual people out there I could name who I wanted to really like this book. Like I thought if so-and-so loves this book, I'm set, right? You know, I'm happy. And so, because, you know, if that person likes it, so would a lot of other people. I mean, there's that. But anyway, so what I did is I actually wrote those names down on a sheet of paper and stuck it over my desk. So that every time when I was working on the book and I came to a decision point, like, well, do I use this word or that word? 
or do I need to explain such and such before I go into this next step? You exactly. You can just look there and go, you know, she wouldn't understand it unless I explained this. So then I explain this, right? So it says if you're really talking to that person. Right. And it's uh, another example of sort of outsourcing your cognition in some sense. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. And it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, it works. I and do those, the same thing with research questions and theses. Yeah. I write them on a little tent stick in front of me. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. No, that makes sense. That makes good sense. There's also, sorry, yeah. I don't mean to no, tell you. No, 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 go ahead. So this is an interesting, you bring up audience, not something I expected to talk about, but but it's an By the way, by the way, you should yeah. tell your students when, after they underline the topic census, that doesn't have to be permanent. Like you don't have to, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't have to turn the paper in with that, but it forces you doing that. You see those sentences and you go, you know, that's not quite right. Exactly. All right. And I spend, actually, I spend a lot of time in class or many times in class. We'll, we'll frame my suggestions to students as being the easy way to do it. Like say, look, you've got a paper due tomorrow. You got, you know, six other things you got to get done tonight. You got 10 minutes to spend on this paper. What's the one best thing mm -hmm. you can do? As, and and something like, what's the most important sentence in that paper? And, you know, it's arguably probably the first one. Right. And most of the time, people don't pay attention to their first sentence. They just use, well, OK, now I'm going to talk about something. Yeah, don't do that. Why throw it away? It's the only sentence that you know a reader is going to read. Because after if that one's not good, they may not read the rest of the thing. Well, students think about it. I mean, I always hated the idea. So it's, of, sorry, I, I did cut you off that time. Yeah. Well, no, it's just it's just the idea of I try to give when I give suggestions to them, I try to give them the smallest thing they can do for the biggest result. Yeah. And it's not because I want them to not do much work. It's because I want to pull them into the process. And if they do that one sentence and then they go, well, I got five minutes. I, what about the last sentence? And then they tinker with that and they kind of fix it and make it better. And about that time they start getting like, you know, this, I, yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, Let's go back and look. Long. What about the first sentence of the last paragraph? Maybe I just spend a minute fussing. Next thing you know, it's two hours later and the whole damn paper is great. You so know? here's a, here's a funny little yeah. side. Um, I was writing my rhetorical theory paper, which I turned in last night. Yeah. I was in the process of sort of revising and redrafting it last week. And it's about a topic that I have a lot of investment in to some extent. So what that means is that every little thing grabs my attention. Yeah. So I, I started yeah. on, um, I, I started writing something that was kind of related to what I was talking about in the paper. Yeah. And, and and then it was a little bit less related, and then it had very little to do with it. But at that point, like you said, I was too far in. I was like, you know what? I've never put these thoughts down on paper before. I'm just going to keep doing it. And like sooner or later, it was an hour and a half later, yeah. and I'm like, well, you know, I might as well print this out, and I might as well rearrange it a bit so that if I'm like yeah. thinking about, I might send it to this person, like said, like a specific person. Uh, and I realized I just wrote like 1,700 words. <laughs> <laughs> I paid. I just you sure. can, let me be very clear. I just wrote an essay to procrastinate from writing my essay. Yeah, <laughs> and that's how. But but the a reason for yeah. that's how powerful the the inertia of it is. Because yeah. once you get like yeah. the hard part of about studying is getting started. Getting started. Once you're like right. ten or twenty minutes in, you're rolling. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So the trick is to set yourself up a first pro a first exactly. task that's very very doable. Yeah. Where you you can't you can say well there's no excuse I mean for me I mean I gotta just do I'll just do this one thing. Well, even but if you, it's not yeah yeah you even pick it's not the one thing that's important yeah. yeah. So even I, if it's not an excuse, it's more like I can foresee myself as being happier on the other side of this five minute task than I am right now, yeah, and yeah. I would actually be willing to put in the effort to get there. Yeah, you know? yeah, no, or that like, works. That works. Sure. Sure. That's just kind of how I, that's how it registers to me. Which yeah. 
I guess the reason, I guess I'm weird because I'm the one starting a podcast about this whole thing, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that absolutely. Absolutely. The trick is always getting started. So yeah. here's another thing that I total, here's a segue. Yeah. Um, so I, th this semester, um, I guess to date this, this is obviously the fall of 2020. So we've had, you know, COVID going on and everything. And a lot of students have been having trouble. Um, I've had more than one student have to drop the class just because, yeah. you know, he or she couldn't really manage sure. in the face of everything else. And I remember sure. one in particular, I'm obviously not going to name the person, but he or she, mm -hmm. whichever, yeah. um, was just having a rough time. With it. And they'd been really, really putting in the F, try to catch up. And like a little bit before Thanksgiving break, I think, you know, we talked and we just said, you know, he was he or she was clearly in the position where they were a good student and they didn't like the fact that they were on the verge of dropping the class and they were sort of disappointed in themselves oh. and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I sort of channeled you. Yeah. And I even sent them your Wall Street Journal article, actually. <laughs> um, well, because yeah, yeah. I mean, this is all a long segue. Yeah. into asking you to tell maybe the old swimming story or your yeah. general philosophy on yeah students and dropping classes because i think it's a very important thing yeah in general but also right now yeah um right right well let's see how to start that um yeah uh, well well, well no i i mean my old swimming story i used to coach swimming competitive swimming and um I was real into it, you know, and pretty serious. I wasn't very good at it early on. And this happened early on. So, but it was a learning experience. Anyway, so I had this uh, girl on the team who was 12 years old, who was really good, like very good technique and a beautiful feel for the water, which is something you're just kind of born with really. Uh, and, um, and had all kind of ability, but she just wasn't really into it. You know, like she didn't want to work very hard and, and I tried to convince her, you know, like, you know, if you, if you did this thing and this thing and this thing, you could, you could go to the Eastern championships, you could you know, get college scholarships. I was trying, I was trying everything. And, uh, and I tried to push her in practice. And I remember, you know, like getting down on the deck, like, come on, you can do this. And she was just like, eh, you know, she didn't care. And so I, uh, <clears throat> I was in the middle of doing research on Olympic swimmers, actually, at this time and trying to learn to become a good coach simultaneously. And uh, I, so I called up a friend who is an Olympic coach and um, I, I explained the situation and said, what do you think? What do you think? And he said, well, first, he said two things. First, he said, he said, you know, you want this more than she does, right? And I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> I, guess that, I guess that's pretty clear, right? Like, I'm real into this, and she doesn't give a flip. That's a problem. So um, I'm like, yeah, you know, I was a little embarrassed by that realization, of course, because then you're like, right, what am I doing? And then he said, Dan, you got to remember, he said, there's nothing morally wrong with not wanting to swim. And that really hit me. Uh, because I realized that I was kind of looking down on this kid because she wasn't into swimming. And I thought, you know, she's got all this ability and she could do great things. And she, and it was like, she has a kind of moral responsibility to mm -hmm. do the stuff I think she should do with her life. And then I got real uncomfortable about it and realized he was correct. And I, the point is I've adapted that to my academic teaching life as well. There's nothing wrong with not wanting to be a sociology student. You know, like millions of people have done very well in life without ever studying sociology, <laughs> you know, or math or writing. You know, you can have a good life without any of this stuff. And you can be a very good person without caring about this. And so I had to adapt, uh, adopt that um, point of view in classes and realize like a student comes in and they want to drop my class. They, when they come in to drop classes, they always apologize. 
they're like, oh, I want you to know, you know, I re- it's not you. It's not, you know, I really think it's important, but I got this. Other I'm like, it's fine. Okay. This is your life, kiddo, not mine. And I want what's best for you. You know, I try to put myself in that for, and what's best for you right now is to not be doing sociology. That's totally great. You know, let me know if I can, if I can ever help. Well, the, the funny part in a way is that once I started doing that, more students stayed in my classes. I mean, that's the simplest way to put it is once they knew, well, really it's once they knew I respected their life choices. Okay. Then it's a different situation. Like I'm here to help, right? I'm not trying to convince you to, you know, go this way or think that way or whatever. I'm here to help you. And I have faith that that works out most of the time, right? And I've never had a shortage of students in classes, you know? And in fact, they seem to respond well to this approach. So it was a big move. It was a big deal for me. That's... And, it, and it really helped my swim coaching, by the way. <laughs> because I stopped spending my time trying to convince kids who weren't into it. And spent my time with much less talented athletes who really wanted to be good. And you know what? Pretty soon they became better. (laughs) They got like better than the other guys because they were into it. They were eager to learn. And the trick is, is cultivating eagerness to learn. And to do that, you've got to, you've got to always satisfy the people who are real eager. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting thinking about that in conjunction with the earlier points that you've been making about starting small in order to get Mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. Because, I only address this because, you know, it it could seem, although I know it's not, contradictory, mm-hmm. you know? And yeah. I don't yeah, know what you obvious. have to think about that. <clears throat> uh, which part now? Well, just, I mean, if we're going to say, you know, if we're thinking about the students who are listening to this and they're thinking, yeah. okay, well, this guy said, on the one hand, I'm trying to get students into it. Yeah. You know, on the other hand, I'm, you know, not trying to, keep students in if they don't want it like yeah 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 if if they don't if they don't want it right if i have mm-hmm. students who are not into the subject well it happens all the time right students come in after the first exam in intro is typically where it happens comes in and say well you know i'm sure this is all very important stuff but i just think it's a lot of baloney <laughs> i mean that's the i'm being nice about the way they put it but you know they are all crap so uh, I say, okay, um, you know, that's an opinion matter, but, you know, can you tell me why and what do you think would make it more worthwhile? But what I try to do is get an, get a conversation going and find out what it is that actually moves this student. Like, right. what do they care about? And then, you know, it might be that I can point out, well, actually, you know, if you're interested in that, here's what I can tell you that sociology brings to understanding that or something but it's the you know motivation is it's that's all teaching is right again is i feel like is motivating people to want to learn something and everybody's got different motivations that's the funny part like some people want to get good grades and some people a lot of students i've had want to impress the professor which is different Mm -hmm. not the same as getting good grades right i mean they're aligned but yeah Uh, And some people really want to learn about a subject, okay? And some people like the idea of work in their brain, right? And some people like having great conversations with other people. Anyway, everybody's got different stuff going on. But once you can figure out what that is, then you just feed them. (laughs) Yeah, then, yeah, exactly. Well, that's it. It, It's interesting because I've been thinking, I mean, I've been obsessing over I'm interested in writing. I've been obsessing over it for probably yeah. about the better part of a decade now. Yeah, and yeah. One, the <clears> one <throat> thing that I'm thinking more recently over the past semester is that the interest in something obviously has utility. As yeah. 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 But it, I think, well, I think that your interest in a subject actually changes the qualitative nature of the process that you use to write about. And the idea, I'm sorry, say that again. I think that the, 
your being interested in the thing that you're writing about doesn't just make it like sort of more emotionally easier to sit down and do it. I think it actually changes the cognitive process that you're using to pursue the subject. Oh, more. yeah, yeah. What yeah. I mean by that is this. Uh, yeah. I have always hated asking students, so what, with their essays. Mm -hmm. I, I hate that. It never worked for me. I've never found it useful because what it tells the student is, okay, you've moved your ideas to this point. Now get behind them and push them out further to where they could go. And I don't think that's what a lot of academics actually mm -hmm. do. <laughs> uh -huh. I think that what happens cognitively is that they're, when they sit down with a subject, they're interested in it and their interest runs out ahead of them and highlights the next implication that they could go to with their thoughts. So mm -hmm. it's the actual process that we're using is something like being pulled along by your the interest that you already have in the subject. Yeah, yeah. Whereas what we're teaching students with something like so what is to yeah. you know go through the motions and and push the ideas. But yeah but where? that's yeah. the thing, like you don't have a where. Yeah. Yeah. Well this is that's interesting. I uh I'm not it's sure full of hypothesis. I don't know what to make of it exactly. No, no, I'm not I'm not sure I agree hmm. with you. Um in in the following sense. Is it like when I say to students, you know, have a thesis for your paper, like what's the thesis, mm -hmm. what's the point? Uh, a lot of times they find that hard to do. And I definitely find it hard to do. Like I'll write something about some topic and then sit there and go, well, like, what's the point? What are you saying about it? And I have to, and it's, and it is, it's forcing myself to figure out something to say about it. like what's my conclusion or what does that add up to or something and i find that useful actually i find mm. that that format useful and and the big example would be uh uh in two different books i've written i've had to do that where i wrote the whole thing and literally didn't know what the point was until the book was done like what does that add up to and and i remember you know spending some number of weeks is what it was in each case sort of sitting around trying to figure out okay i've said this and this and this and this you know what's that what does that amount to what's and i know there's something in there right because it's me it's all from me like i wrote this and this and this and this and i sequence them out and it leads to something, but I never figured out in advance what that something was, but I wanted there to be one. You know, does that make sense? It, so it I was, does. I was using the process again to think to what is the underlying, me almost unconscious message that was in my own way of living, you might say, That's like I'm, thing. I'm hitting at something here. But I wonder it? if we're so. talking about the same thing, actually. That's very possible. Um, because it, what I'm suggesting is that when you assign a student an essay, mm -hmm. they may not even have no. an unconscious, unstated reason or, you know, yeah. impetus for writing in the first place. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. When, when, when you're talking about that sort of unconscious thing, is it is it something like, Basically, the idea that you were writing to get at, except you didn't know it until the end. Yeah, you yeah absolutely. See, absolutely. But it, my my thought would be that that's kind of the thing that keeps you going. Mm. And that's mm -hmm. probably, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, what guided you to each thing. And what I'm sure. trying to say about the student who were asking, so what? To, they may not have that. We're asking them to act as if they have that underlying impetus when they don't. And I think that changes the nature of the process. I, well, I that's, that would be dishonest. Yeah. You'd be asking them, in effect, to make something up. Is that what you mean? Right. Yeah. yeah. No. That's one of the reasons that right. my big message to students is write honestly. Like yeah. I've spent seven years trying to figure out, like, what are yeah. like my own list of, like, top ten things to tell students. Yeah. So figure, far, figure out, like, one and a half. No, the that's a good one. The one that I figured one. out is write honestly. I, that's I a good that's one. True. That's a good one. But 
that's a good one, although they probably don't know what you mean. Right, which is why I spend an entire semester explaining it to them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. And 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 another thing that I find really useful, like top of the list useful, is one-on-one -on -one meetings. Yeah. If you can do it. If you've got an, you that, know, a manage good. yeah, if you got a manageable number of students, right? Uh I always do um like writing conferences probably four, five, six weeks into the semester after I've gotten a few examples of what they can do. Mm -hmm. So we have something to work with, not just one paper, but so you want to be able to see the patterns and what's the person's habits and stuff. What are the, and, and, and a one-on-one -on -one meeting and then just ask them, well, what, what were you trying to do here? What are you doing there? And then at some point you can see the stuff you're talking about. Like yeah. you can see, you know, what this person really cares about is this. Yeah. You know, that's what she's really trying to get at, but she's kind of dancing around it, you know, maybe thinks it'd be goofy to say it out loud or something of that sort. And then you get to the honesty possibility. Well, the thing I would always tell my um, students in writing center conferences, and I would whisper it so that no one else could hear me, was that, <laughs> you know, they should swear in their writing. <laughs> that's uh -huh. right out of the feeling that you have to sound right. It just gets you down to it. Yeah, you're... yeah. And then, you, and then you run a very careful, like, find function after you've written the paper yeah but, yeah but at least you get a sense of where the emotion is and things of that sort yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, see, i mean i would um when i was teaching at uva mm -hmm. it was last year i mean my final research paper i just said research anything mm. i don't care what mm -hmm. but make it useful to you like you, you there are going to be very few opportunities in college where you get yeah. a chance to research about anything. Yeah. So maybe you've got something that you're thinking about going into for a major. Yeah. And you want to do a little bit of research into that field to see if that's something you want to do. Mm -hmm. Sure. Maybe you've got something you wanted to learn more about in high school and you didn't get a chance and you think it'd be useful for you to learn more about it. Yeah. Great. Maybe you've got an application coming up and you need a writing sample. Right. Do that. And the papers that I got back from them on that were just fantastic. Yeah. They, well, yeah. They cared. Yeah. And yeah. they were interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Makes a big difference. Yeah. Well, yeah. Then. That's great. All right. Have we hit? I don't know. That feels like a good. The topics you wanted to hit? It feels like a good stopping point. Do you have any? <laughs> I'll give you the final word, though. Again, what would you say to the first year students? You know, I, it's it's what I think about college in general is you ought to study stuff. Uh, well, there are two ways to pick what you study. Number one is study stuff you're into. But the other is is take courses and such with great teachers because they will show you how there's other stuff you'll be into that you didn't even know existed or you never thought about it. I mean, that's what a great teacher is, right? Is they get you into something you weren't interested in. I mean, that's part of it anyway. So, uh, but, but basically you've got to follow your own heart. And the nice thing is that turns out, I think, I believe to be uh, really quite a practical way of doing things. All right. By that, I mean, um, if you're an English major in college and you want to go into business, like don't study business if you want to if you want to be reading novels, right? You ought to read novels because if you're really into it, you'll get so much more out of it. That will help your business career far more than plotting your way through courses you think you ought to take. Um, because the real problem in college again is motivation, uh, not not any particular subject matter. And if you're motivated, whatever works to really get you fired up about what you're doing, that works. Um, and another version of that, again, when I talk to students about, you know, going on the job market and they say, oh, well, what can I do with sociology? I, I actually say, you know, happiness is a job skill. And what I mean by that is being excited about what you're doing taking your work seriously, finding fulfillment in it, all of that stuff shows through the minute you walk in a door with somebody for a job interview. They can see. 
you know, that you're into it. And my experience has been most people in business, they don't care what your major was anyway. They care, are you smart? Are you motivated? Are you eager to learn? You know, all that kind of stuff. And in fact, studying stuff you're into works for all of that. You know, it develops soft skills is another way to put it. Um, plus, I think the, the the bad rap on English majors is people don't understand what you do as an English major. So, um, I mean, my experience with it was English was really about, you know, human decisions. And I mean, you're reading literature, it's human decisions and tragedy and loss and fulfillment. And it's psychology is what it really is. But psych departments don't study that anymore. So, you know, it's got to be English departments <laughs> where the students actually deal with human relationships in a lot of very deep and detailed ways um so anyhow that was just a meandering but yeah writing it's fine I and mean, again i think of it as a craft is like here's this cool thing you can learn how to do it's uh it's hard to do at a very high level but it's not hard to do at a at an okay level you know you can it's like playing the piano let's say you can you can get reasonably good at it decently quickly um you know it's not like the violin or something which is impossible until you're really good <laughs> well that seems like a beautiful spot to end okay um sounds so, good to me professor chambliss thank you again it's been an honor fame thank you so oh. much good luck good luck with your series here and uh, everything you're doing thanks much okay take care You've just finished an episode of Things That First Year Writers Need to Hear. If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing. It'd help this reach more people. And check out another episode if you want, or maybe something a bit shorter if you'd prefer.